Ready? Two. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to uh, have uh, Lieutenant Commander Trenton Long, the chaplain for Coast Guard Sector St. Pete, will give the invocation. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are humbled to be able to take a moment to remember the 23 who gave their lives 40 years ago today. It is humbling because we recognize that you've granted us with the grace as the United States Coast Guard to continue to faithfully serve. For the family and friends of the members of those that are joined here with us today and as shipmates, we recognize the solemn moment that this is. But we also want to celebrate their lives because they did not die in vain. Help us to find inspiration in the legacy that they left behind for us to follow. Watch over the United States Coast Guard as we continue to carry out the mission that even the crew of the Blackthorn was set to do. May we never forget. I pray that all that is done here this morning in this ceremony would be glorifying and honoring to you. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Good morning, uh, Secretary Chad Wolf, Admiral Carl Schultz, Rear Admiral Merlin, uh, Admiral Eric Jones, uh, Captain Thompson, Captain McGilley, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, uh, Jason Vanderhead, and Master Chief uh, Shane Hooker. Those of the local Coast Guard commands, family and friends, thank you for coming to remember the 23 Coast Guard men lost in Blackthorn tragedy on the 28th of January, 1980, approximately two miles south of the monument in Tampa Bay. We are privileged to have 42 immediate family members of Infant Sarner, Chief Warrant Officer Jack Roberts, ET1 Jerome Ressler, QM2 Gary W. Crumley, EM3 Edward Sindelar III, Seaman Apprentice William Flores, Seaman Apprentice John Prosco, and Seaman Apprentice George Ravolas. Also survivors attending today are, are George Siepel, Charlie Bartell, Ephraim Solis, Ron Luttrell, Steve Coleman, Richard Murth, Jim Hughes, and Larry Cutter, and Mr. Shine. The park was named U.S. Coast Guard Blackthorn Memorial Park by an act of Florida legis legislator in June 1980 and resoundingly reconfirmed a few years ago by the Florida Department of Transportation and the Department of Environmental Protection. This monument, dedicated one year after the tra tragedy on 28 January 1981, was the result of concerns and generosity of a caring public, individuals and organizations, both military and civilian. On behalf of the Blackthorn Memorial Committee, let me thank you for the encouragement your presence here today gives us on this 40th year. I resolve that programs such as this, honoring the memory of our Blackthorn shipmates, shall continue as an annual event because of your presence here today. The memorial will continue to be maintained with dignity and respect rightly reserved as the Memorial Park after remodeling of the rest area is now have been completed. I would like to also thank the Chiefs Mess for the Air Station and Sector St. Pete for the coordination of many active duty chiefs who this past year have done so much to make it look the way it does today. In fact, we were out here two weeks ago on Wednesday when it was 30 degrees. So thank you again. We have the bell here today from the Blackthorn. Its new home is in the Chiefs Mess at Sector St. Pete. It's now my pleasure to introduce the, from the Padre Luis DeSoto Assembly, 4th Degree Knight of Columbus from Bradenton, as they for 39 years in a row placed their reef at the base of the monument and take an honor guard position for the rem remainder of the service. Doing this will be past faithful navigator Dennis Warren, and Jack McNeil is the faithful piglet. Now, Chief Warrant Officers W-4, Jeff Timberlake, Suncoast President, and National President Mark 
Portor will present the read for the Suncoast Chapter Chief Warrant Officers Association. Now, Captain Tom Fisher, U.S. Coast Guard retired, and Gene Harris for VFW Post 793 of Largo, Florida, will place their arrangement. Representing Camp Tampa Council of Navy League, Skip Winooski and Ira Labeth will place their arrangement. Representing Sarasota Manatee Council of Navy League, Tim Lockler and Mr. St. Germain will place their arrangement. Now, immediate past president Lynn Vandalud and first vice president Mark Vanalenti of the Propeller Club Port of Tampa will place their arrangement. Propella Club Port of Manatee, Matty Appos and David St. Pierre will place their arrangement. Representing the Florida Chief Petty Officer Association, Chief Warrant Officer Rich Spur and YNC Steve Miglianico will place their arrangement. Representing the Fleet Reserve Association, Southeast Regional President Lori Bailey and Ladies Auxiliary Gail will please their uh, monument, their uh, arrangement.
U.S. Coast Guard Chief Petty Officer Association, St. Pete Chapter, Senior Chief Gabriel Acosta, President, and Chief Aaron Evison, Vice President, will place their wreath. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chad F. Wolf, Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, Mr. Wolf was designated as Acting Secretary of Homeland Security by President Donald J. Trump on November 13, 2019, and confirmed under the, as the first sec Under Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans. Previously, he served as the Acting Under Secretary. Since his selection by the President, Mr. Wolf has advanced many of the administration's critical priorities across the entire Homeland Security mission. Mr. Wolf oversaw the completion of the recently released Department of Homeland Security Strategic Plan, which established the Department's long-term strategic goals, objectives to inform key leadership decisions. Additionally, he led several significant initiatives to counter international and domestic terrorism, preventing terrorist travel, safeguard the U.S. electoral process, and protect the American trade interests. As part of his duties, Mr. Wolf led and coordinated the Department's engagement with international partners to protect American homeland security interests at home and abroad. With over 20 years of policy development and management experience in both the public and private sectors, Mr. Wolf is an effective leader and policymaker on various of variety of complex issues. During the Trump administration, he served as Chief of Staff for the Transportation Secretary Administration, Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief of Staff for the Department. For his leadership and management of complex national issues, Mr. Wolf received the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Distinguished Service Medal. Shortly after the terrorist attack on September 11, 2001, Mr. Wolf served as the Assistant Administrator of Transportation Security Policy, in which he played a leading role in the establishment of the Transportation Security, Security Administration. Mr. Wolf. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here today, and it's certainly a, pr a privilege to be here with the survivors, the families, the friends, and the Coast Guard men and women at the 40th anniversary of the tragic sinking of the Coast Guard cutter Blackthorn. To those who have traveled to join us, thank you for being here to honor the brave men lost 40 years ago today. As Acting Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, I have the great honor to lead the 240,000 men and women of this department. There are numerous privileges that come with this post, or so I'm told, uh, but none is greater than being the service secretary to the 41,000 active duty, the 7,000 reservists, the 8,600 civilian, and the 29,000 auxiliary members of the United States Coast Guard. I have found no finer public servants anywhere in the United States government. As our nation's Coast Guard, you secure our ports and waterways, interdict drug smugglers, lead search and rescue missions, and respond to national emergencies. As our nation's Coast Guard, you courageously head out on dark and stormy nights so that others may live. There is no greater example of service. Today, we are here to honor one Coast Guard crew in particular, the crew of the Cutter Blackthorn. Forty years ago, 23 of these heroes lost their lives in the line of duty, but they have not, nor will they ever, pass from our memory. The tragedy of the Cutter Blackthorn changed the Coast Guard forever, providing a painful lesson on risk management and training. After this loss of life, critical improvements were made to service readiness, training, and safety that still echo across the service today. What also echoes across the service is the importance of the mission that the Cutter Blackthorn crew performed, aids to navigation. This mission is absolutely critical to facilitating commerce safely. And while the Port of Tampa Bay has always been a valuable port, it is certainly different than it was 40 years ago. And indeed, it has grown into the largest port in the region. And Coast Guardsmen and women today are still performing this vital mission here at the Port of Tampa. They realize, just as the crew of the Cutter Blackthorn did 40 years ago, that when the last line is cast off the pier, 
or the aircraft leaves the deck, or that inspector steps foot off the commercial ship, or that team goes over the gunnel to connect, conduct that boarding, that they are entering a dangerous and what can often be an unforgiving environment, regardless of the weather. The sea, while often characterized as mysterious and majestic, can be just as dark and treacherous under any circumstances. Our Coast Guardsmen and women know this reality very well. We remember and we honor the crew of the Cutter Blackthorn, both those surviving and those lost. Each of them is forever part of the Coast Guard's legacy, and each of them is indelibly stamped on the fabric of our department and to the history of our nation. I could not think of a better way to honor and remember the 23 sailors we lost than to introduce a man who I've gotten to know well over the past several years, a man who I deeply respect and a man who is selfless leader to our Coast Guard men and women. In fact, he is the epitome of the motto Semper Paratus, and I am proud to serve the nation and in the department with him. Please join me in welcoming the 27th Commandant to the United States Coast Guard, Admiral Carl Schultz. That's where it's going to be. Good morning, everyone. What a privilege it is to be here um, on the shoreline of Tampa Bay. I had the privilege of commanding the Ventress and plying these waters for two years. Um, have ties to the buoy tender community, sister ships, Gentian, Acacia, Conifer. What a great turnout. Secretary, we are truly honored with your presence today. I'm not sure if it's the first time or not that a service secretary has been here. It's pretty special being here on the fourth anniversary. And Bill Merlin's giving me a head nod, so it is the first time we've had a service secretary. So thank you for that, sir. Today we reflect back, as the secretary mentioned, on those 23 crew members who tragically lost their life not far from this location here in Tampa Bay. And um, it's about honoring those who perished. It's about honoring shipmates who survived and the families and descendants of those that are here today. You know, if I borrow from President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, these 23 crew members from the Blackthorn are amongst those who gave their last full measure of devotion and service to their nation. I'd like to ask that all the survivors, those shipmates from Blackthorn, would you please stand that are here with us today? Thank you, gentlemen. And I'd like to ask that any I'd like to ask that any family members, descendants, and friends of the Blackthorn crew rise and stand. And I'd like to ask if there's any, I know there's at least a handful of folks that were involved in the recovery of the Blackthorn, if you'd also rise and stand because you have a key part of this whole legacy as well. Thank you very much, and thank you for the honor of joining you today. Let me also thank Master Chief Jesserow. John, you've been at this for a bunch of years, and you and the work of the committee, this, is, this doesn't happen without some effort. This site doesn't remain as poignant and beautiful as it is. So thank you so much, Master Chief, for your continued interest there. You know, this, is a, this is a lovely location at the foot of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, a different Sunshine Skyway Bridge and sat here in 1980. You know, this region is truly an epicenter of Coast Guard operations and Coast Guard community ties. Um, and it's really an epicenter of the future of the Coast Guard. We intend to be here in the St. Pete, Tampa area for a long time to come. And uh, just as we come off the back heels of Gasparilla, we think about another cutter with a tragic background that has a real distinct tie, the Cutter Tampa. You know, back about 15, 17 months ago, then Chief of Staff Wolf participated with then Secretary Nielsen over in Coast Guard headquarters on September 26, 2018. We recognized the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the USS Tampa over in the World War I theater when a single torpedo took her and 130 sailors on board. But this community continues to have a tie through Tampa. This community continues to have a tie through the Blackthorn and with the men and women that stand to watch every day here, whether it's at the air station, whether it's at the sector, all the outlying units. This is a pretty special place 
to be a Coast Guardsman. Today's a pretty important special day to be here with you. You know, yesterday was also uniquely special in that the Flores family, and I saw Richard and Sam, I saw um, what would have been Billy Flores' nephew, Bobby, who's a junior ROTC guy, going to join the Marine Corps, had a chance to meet them briefly. I read a nice article about that. But yesterday, over on the Coast Guard property at Sector St. Pete, there was a dedication of the Seaman William Billy Flores statue. It's a statue, the first statue of, I think there's now 12 existing, but the first one that's individualized to an in, a person, a specific service member, that's going to sit 10 miles offshore on the ocean's bottom in a very unique underwater memorial to those that served. And we're just really tickled pink that the Floreses are here today to be part of this. It's the Circle of Heroes Memorial is uh, what that's called about. And, um, you know, we reflect back on those 22 shipmates in addition to Billy that perished aboard the Blackthorn. It was our worst loss in peacetime history of the Coast Guard, right here, two miles from this location. As I think back to that fateful day in 1980, you say, where were you at the time? I was a young fourth-class cadet, and I remember the morning after the accident, at the morning meal, someone stood in front. I can't remember the face. I think it was the officer of the day. And he told a little bit of the, the, the storyline. It wasn't specifics, but there had been an accident here, just outside the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, where a Coast Guard cutter had a terrible collision, and many souls were lost. And I think back. You know, that was a period in time when we were reeling on the heels of another loss 15 months previously, the Cutter Cuyahoga, up near Smith Point in the Chesapeake Bay, 11 souls on board. That was an officer candidate training mission from our training center in Yorktown. And when you look at those situations, as we reflected on them immediately in the losses, we continue to reflect. You know, what seems simple now, but wasn't so simple then, but, you know, lapses in judgment, qualifications, training, causal factors that tie to the loss of 34 lives. And as I reflect back, I think about just how seminal that was in shaping my thinking as a Coast Guardsman, as a Coast Guard Cutterman. My keen focus today on readiness in people absolutely is tied back to those influential years of just learning about these tragedies almost, you know, 40 years ago to the day. Most of us know the tragic story of the Blackthorn well. That's why we're here today. After extended maintenance period here in Tampa in the shipyard, those sailors were heading home to welcoming families back in Galveston, Texas. 50 aboard from all walks of life. Setting sail that afternoon of the 28th of January, 1980, to head home to welcoming arms in Galveston. And in a blur, after being overtaken by a highly lit Russian passenger ship, the Kakistan Cutter Blackthorn in the 600-foot SS Capricorn collided. Unfortunately, Capricorn's anchor, which all sailors know is in the ready position for launching, operating in inside waterways, caught Blackthorn's port side and brought her over, and she sank in minutes. In those moments, those limited, precious minutes, 23 lives were lost. And here we are, a few hours short of 40 years later, remembering, because it's in remembering that we honor, that we honor and continue to honor those lost in service. Shortly, we're going to keenly listen to the names of those brave 23 souls. And it's important, the chaplain mentioned, they did not die in vain. During those difficult and painful moments in the aftermath of the tragedy, we as a service reflected. We reflected on how things could and should have gone differently. We identified those lessons. We studied the after actions to prevent this type of tragedy again in the future. As a service, we took very deliberative action steps to enhance proficiency, safety in our float operations. And those steps in the aftermath of this tragedy pull forth today. I don't think our fleet's ever been more proficient, more ready, more ready to serve the nation. Most notably back in the aftermath of the Blackthorn tragedy, we created cutter navigation standards. We created a perspective commanding officer and prospective executive officer course in New London. And no sailor goes to sea today in a command position without going through that course to make sure when they step back afloat, they're at the top of his or her game. The students who pass through that course today, they reflect on case studies, including the case study of the Blackthorn. And it's really part of their collective DNA and part of our service collective DNA. So we don't forget that we learn. 
The sailors of the Coast Guard today are very much like the sailors of the Coast Guard back in 1980. They're the same remarkably capable, ambitious, bright young people who stepped forth to serve their nation. They had hopes and dreams like our folks do today. They come from families with parents and siblings, loved ones who will miss them dearly every time they deploy. And above all else, they came and come today with a dedication to something bigger than themselves. Young men and women willing to protect, serve, and defend our great nation, even against daunting odds. You know, in today's Coast Guard, we're thankful that there's people like William Billy Flores. Billy was 19 years old, one year into his Coast Guard career when he tragically perished out here in Tampa Bay. From the great seafaring state of New Mexico, Carlsbad to be exact. Billy was one year out of boot camp, as I mentioned. As I reflect back, Billy's about four or five months younger than I. And when you see Richard and Sam, his brothers here, it really puts perspective on that. And who knows where he would have been. Maybe he would have done his years in service. Maybe he would have been the Master Chief Petty Officer Coast Guard. But today we honor Billy because he's part of this group of 23 who lost their lives here. Billy stayed on board. The story is he climbed up on the life jacket locker. He was tossing life jackets to those in the water. He took his belt off his uniform and tied the life jacket locker open so that jackets would float free for those in the water who managed to get above decks and managed to possibly have a chance at surviving. After most of the survivors who were originally above deck or got above deck were off the ship, Billy stayed with the ship. He tried to trap, tried to save more of the shipmates that were trapped in the interior of the ship. The accident occurred about 8.20 in the evening after dark. For those Billy couldn't help, he comforted them with the only thing he had, his words. In his extraordinary efforts to aid, to comfort, and to save, Seaman Billy Flores lost his life that night. For his heroism, heroism, excuse me, 20 years ago, then Commandant Jim Lloyd, the 21st Commandant, and then Master Pass Commandant Vince Patton, posthumously recommended Billy Flores for the Coast Guard Medal. And uh, that medal was presented to the family on 16 September 2000. That's a historic date because of Mexican the date because that's a date that Mexican Americans celebrate for Mexican liberation from Spain. About a week ago. I had the privilege of connecting with Admiral Jim Loy. Now, Jim Loy is still very active, helping with the National Coast Guard Museum, and Jim Loy is just one of those great Americans that also served this country, in his case, in the Coast Guard uniform. But Jim talked to me about just how much he would love to have been here today, but he couldn't be here. But Jim was the skipper at the time of this accident on the Valiant, home port of the Galveston, which was the Blackthorns' home port. And Jim had just gotten back that day from his patrol, and he was heading home that night when he heard on the radio the tragic loss of the Blackthorn. Not a lot of details, but he told me one of his proudest moments were in the coming days, weeks, and months when his shipmates, shipmates from the Valiant, embraced those surviving shipmates, maybe some amongst the crowd today, and the family members of the Blackthorn who shared that home port in Galveston. And to the Flores family, and to the other families and descendants, to the Blackthorn shipmates, I just want to extend Jim Loy's heartfelt gratitude for you being here and his true passion and continued commitment to this event and the importance of this Blackthorn event in our Coast Guard history. Jim was excited to learn of the statue as well, so I got to find some pictures of that ceremony yesterday and make sure I share them with him. But you know, you think about where this situation is, I talked about the seminal impacts, and you look at other events. The Navy tragically lost a couple combatants in the last year, the Fitzgerald, the McCain. And we continue to study their studies of that. We had Coast Guards involved in that. It's a dangerous business going to sea, and we constantly look to hone and sharpen our skills. That tragic night 40 years ago, this crew, those survivors here and those lost, were thrust into a set of circumstances they never could have imagined, never could have expected. You know, our core values didn't come in place till about 25 years ago this past April, but those sailors that night, they embodied, they embraced, they lived our core values of today of honor, respect, devotion to duty. And each of those 23 perished are part of our long blue line, our long blue line of heroes that extend all the way back to our earliest roots as the Revenue Marine Service in 1790. And all the way, that blue line, that thread pulls through to 2020. 
Today, Coast Guardsmen stand the watch. Polar Stars down in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. We have seven ships, seven, eight ships patrolling in the Eastern Pacific and in the Deep Caribbean against transnational criminals. On the waterways across the heartland, across the Great Lakes, that's your Coast Guard. As the Secretary indicated, at work, standing the watch. Our Coast Guard men and women launch boats, cutters, airplanes, when others would hesitate. When the job seems humanly impossible, that's when our people most heroically stand. And they stand the watch. They set off into hurricanes against thwarting those violent smugglers. And it's spending long and arduous days away from loved ones and families. They protect, they defend. They risk their lives to safeguard this great nation. And today's Coast Guardsmen, we won't forget those heroes, those Blackthorn sailors who went before us. They made the ultimate sacrifice. This tragedy still tugs at our heartstrings. We mourn those lost Coast Guardsmen. We honor and celebrate amongst their family members who wait for them still to come home. So in closing, let me just wrap up by saying, together, today, we gather. We remember. We honor the 23 Coast Guardsmen who tragically lost their lives here. May they rest peacefully at their maker's side. And to all that gather here today, I wish you Godspeed, and I hope you depart this ceremony knowing that the legacy of our Blackthorn shipmates is carried in the hearts and minds of our Coast Guard men and women today. Men and women who, like their Blackthorn shipmates, answered that call, that call to serve their nation, that call to be amongst the less than 1% that wear the cloth of the nation and stand the watch. God bless, Semper Paratus, thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Schultz. We now will have the traditional Coast Guard Cutterman salute reading of the names in a Rose presentation. Traditionally, the Cutterman salute has been performed by sector personnel from various assigned cutters. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Master Chief Jason Vander Hayden. Master Chief Petty Officer Vander Hayden assumed the duties of the 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard on May 17, 2018. He is a senior enlisted member of the Coast Guard and principal advisor to the Commandant of All Enlisted Personnel Matters. The Cutterman Salute. It is with great honor that I stand before you today representing the Cutterman of the St. Petersburg, Florida and pay tribute to the sailors who were lost on the 28th of January, 1980. The cutter was built in 1944 and referred to as Hull 391. She was named and will always be referred to as Blackthorn. Today, we bring you 23 cuttermen from Coast Guard Cutter Joshua Appleby and Coast Guard Cutter Flores and Aids to Navigation Team St. Petersburg, who will place a rose on the memorial for each of our fellow cuttermen who were lost that day. This is to forever remind us that they should and always will be remembered as the individuals who lost their lives serving as we do today. MKC Ralph Wilson will ring Blackthorn's bell for each crewman who cannot muster with us today. We are here to remember SS1, Sabrino Avila. SNGM, Randolph Barnaby.
NK2, Richard Boone. Seaman Apprentice, Warren Brewer. QM2, Gary Crumley. DC-2, Daniel Estrada. EM-2, Thomas Faulkner. Seaman Apprentice, William Flores. SS3, Donald Frank. DC-3, Lawrence Fry. QM-3, Richard Gold. Seaman Apprentice, Charles Hall. Seaman Apprentice, Glenn Harrison. MK1, Bruce LaFond. Fireman Apprentice, Michael Luke. MK1, Danny Maxey.
Seaman Apprentice, John Prosco. ET1, Jerome Wrestler. Chief Warrant Officer Jack Roberts, Jr. Seaman Apprentice George Ravolis, Jr. Ensign Frank Sarna. EM3, Edward Sendelar the third. MKC Luther Stidham Thank you, Mass Chief uh, Van der Hayden. I would now like to call upon the following family members to assist the Commandant and Secretary Wolf as they place the Memorial Fund uh, brief. Could I have uh, Carlene, uh, Col Carlene, sister of uh, George Ravolis, Patricia, the mother of Frank Sarna, Heather, the daughter of uh, Jack Roberts, Sam, the brother of William Flores, and Molly, the mother of Seaman Apprentice Prosco. At this time, we have a, have a presentation from the survivors to the air station and sectors chief's mess by Captain Siepel and Commander Littrell. Y'all will come forward. And can we have uh, Mass Chief uh, uh, Izzo from the air station and Master Chief uh, Napple from uh, the sector, please come forward.
Thank you, John. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your presence, the Commandant, uh, other distinguished guests, especially Admiral Merlin. I think we pushed paper together in uh, headquarters. We're here today. Uh, there's a Coasty Cutter Barbershop in Juneau, run by Lyra Ware, who's the Coast Guard wife, and she has models hanging in her barbershop. And I said, where did you get those? She says, oh, my relatives in the Philippines. I said, well, could you make this? And she arranged for it and she had it done. It was shipped to me and then I shipped it to John. The purpose of this token is our gratefulness from the survivors, my crewmates, the families, all of you here, everyone that has worked diligently to keep, to keep the memories alive, we want to thank you with all our hearts. Y'all can leave him there if you want. You want to leave him there? Okay. Yeah. We'll leave them there on the table so you can come by and look at them after the ceremony. And then these two get to figure out how they're going to rotate them back and forth each month. And where they'll store them for presentation. I right, will you please rise for the benediction and remain standing for the remainder of today's ceremony. Let us pray again. Our gracious assembly, Father, we come to you again with much thanks. Thank you for the gift of remembrance. Thank you that you allow us to take moments to mark the years of remembrance that have passed. Help us not to grow weary in remembering, but to be more energized and to share the incredible legacy that has gone before. God bless our lifesaver. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Now we have Semper Paratus. Taps. Before that, we'll have Amazing Grace by the U.S. Coast Guard Pipe Band.
On behalf of the Memorial Committee, thank you for your attendance. This concludes the program for the 40th Memorial. And again, thank you for attending. We hope to see you here next year for the 41st Memorial Service back here in Memorial Park. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you. Here, sir.